This is May 5th, our 10th lesson out of Unit 3. Unit 3 entitled, The Spread of the Gospel. And our lesson 10 is entitled, Putting the Past Behind Us. It's from our Faith Pathway Study Manual. And our devotional reading is John the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 11, a very familiar passage. The background scripture is the third chapter of Romans, and then our printed passage is Romans 3, verses 21 through 31. And our key verse is, All are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. Romans, the third chapter, uh, verses 24 and 25. And our lesson's aims are to summarize Paul's teaching about justification through grace and not through acts of law-keeping. To rejoice that one's past sin need not be atoned for by heroic acts or strict observance of laws. And to give thanks to God for Jesus, our one and only perfect Savior. These are our lesson's aims, and as we begin, uh, we have three sections. The first section is entitled, All Messed Up, and that would be uh, supported by the third chapter of Romans, uh, verses 21 through 23. And then our second section is, All Opened Up. And that would be from Romans 3, verses 24 through 26. And then our last section would be all cleaned up. And that would be from Romans, the third chapter, verses 27 through 31. So now as we begin, uh, our first section, which is again titled, All Messed Up. There's a uh, significant reading in the beginning of our lesson under the introduction. It is by Leon F. Stelzer. Uh, and uh, the following uh, statement is a quotation from something that uh, he uh, cited. And it reads, Rarely is dwelling on the past seen in a positive light, nor should it be. Thinking too much about times gone by typically keeps your mind and life stuck in neutral. In parentheses, it reads, and maybe even shifts it into reverse. If you habitually re ruminate over your earlier life, you might regularly be revisited by feelings of anger, guilt, resentment, sorrow, or shame. And such emotions are hardly productive. Now, now this is a appropriate insight into the beginning of our lesson ex with uh, specific attention to the title all messed up um, because uh, it lifts a unfortunate preoccupation we seemingly have where we are constantly uh, dwelling on our past. Uh, one of the uh, citations that was lifted here was is that uh, our preoccupation with these things are hardly productive. Uh, 
but we we definitely identify that these are not positive or constructive or meaningful uh, practices or means by which they will produce uh, productive outcomes. But the positive and constructive things that we dwell upon, those produce more beneficial or profitable fruit works um, and not uh, works uh, that we enumerate as though we're tallying up a list but rather service and submission unto the will of God. Uh, but when we, when we look at the, what was said uh, sometimes it appears as though the humbling of us as individuals only comes when we dwell upon our sinfulness. It appears as though that we can all come together under one thing, and that is all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that's something collectively all over the world we can agree upon. We can all come together on that. Um, but isn't it strange that something that God sent his son Christ to die for, to remove us from the shame of, is the one thing that we collectively agree upon we're all the same by. Um, it appears as though that uh, the shamefulness of sin is somehow has some certain magnetism to it that uh, all of us, it keeps us from pointing our fingers at each other because we can all say, well, you know, ain't none of us perfect. Uh, but uh, what um, I want to, to provide for us is a scriptural text that while we focus so much on our sinfulness rather than the righteousness of God, uh, wouldn't it be uh, a breath of fresh air if we could all come together the same as we easily and readily acknowledge that we're all the same because of sin. But wouldn't it be a breath of fresh air if we could all agree that we're the same because of righteousness, because of fulfilling the will of God and being submissive to the will of God? So as we uh, entertain just the beginning uh, the first three verses, 21 through 23. Um, I wanted to read this in addition to that because it also equips us uh, with other scriptures that may enable us to free ourselves from this preoccupation of sin and shame. So, uh, in Hebrews the uh, 10th chapter, uh, starting at the 16th verse. Now this is distinguishing the superiority of Christ over laws, or Christ over old practices, or Christ over ritualistic uh, practices, things that we do repeatedly over and over and over and over again, uh, as though it is a uh, continuance of a cleansing that we have to uh, constantly do this as the priests did once every year going into the Holy of Holies to plead pardon and atonement for the sins of the whole nation of Israel. So now we have the one sacrifice, the shedding of blood, of righteous blood, one time which did not require a repetition, a yearly practice. And here is what scripture says in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. It says, and this is 
the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. Now this is the agreement that he will make with the believers after those days. And he says, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Not on tablets, not in a book, not on paper, uh, not on the internet screen, but in their heart and in their minds. And he says, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now if God, whose memory is definitely uh, greater than ours, but if God says that I'm not going to dwell on it anymore, I'm going to not going. I'm not going to remember it. I'm not going to keep bringing it up. I'm not going to throw it in your face. Then, if God can put it into the place of forgetfulness, then why do we keep bringing it up all the time? <laughs> it says, "Now where there is remission of these." There is no longer a offering for sin. And we often say without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So I wanted to read that, but also I want to read this out of the sixth chapter of Romans. Because part of our lesson is uh, directed towards uh, the... Uh, game of blaming uh, sin and the acknowledgement of who has sinned and why because they have sinned or because they think they have not sinned but they're following to the uh, letter uh, different uh, laws and practices and uh, different um, uh, uh, commandments and duties and responsibilities uh, because they have a list, a tally of things that they do that that somehow makes them better than others. And our lesson is trying to uh, break the distinction of that and uh, acknowledge what, what makes all of us, what gives all of us freedom from that occupation. Uh, so I wanted to also read out of the sixth chapter of Romans. And here it says in the 14th verse, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. It says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. So simply because we are in the period of grace and we are free from the restraints or the restrictions of the law, it doesn't mean that we could just be an ex excuse by French as it is said, but it, it doesn't mean that we could just be buck wild and then uh, attribute it to, well, you know, we're not under the law we're not held to any certain restrictions and requirements. So therefore, we're under grace and we can just do as we please and pray because Christ has already been offered as the sacrifice for all of our sins. Uh, that definitely is not the intention. Uh, but here it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So this is verse 16, which I just read. And then I wanted to, and you can read all the way through, but for the sake of time, I wanted to read over to uh, verse 20 in the same chapter. Because it says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. When we were preoccupied with the practices of sin, uh, 
we chose. Again, as it says, do we not know that to whom you render yourselves slaves, to, to that one you also have uh, rendered yourselves, that that's who you will obey. So when we were uh, preoccupied with doing our own thing, with uh, following our own guidelines, maybe even being uh, persuaded or influenced, by the persuasion of the peer group around us. But when we were um, slaves to sin, we were free from the practices of righteousness. Um, uh, our hearts and our ears were hardened. We didn't hear. But it says, but what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? So, how many of us brag about what we did before we heard the voice of God, before we heard the voice of righteousness? How many of us brag about what we did and hold it up as an example or as a light? So the scripture says, uh, what fruit did you have in those things which you are now ashamed? Many of us now look back and see where we came from, our past, and we recognize that those were wasted times, wasted energies. How much more could we have accomplished if we weren't, if we weren't misdirected or distracted or sidetracked by other things? So it says, but now having been set free from sin and having become servants or slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I wanted to uh, lift those as we opened up with the introduction and the um, saying or the citation from uh, Leon uh, Steltzer uh, with uh, the focus on the past and uh, I wanted to move uh, further into our lesson and uh, that part coming into our second part here where we begin to speak about that we are justified by the grace through the redemption of Christ Jesus uh, whom shed the shedding of righteous blood, that this was the remission of our sins from our past that, that brought us into the forbearance of God. And so as we look at this, I, I wanted us to uh, also address these concerns uh, as we approach this. Now, when, when we look at being justified freely by the grace of God through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We want to uh, make a comparison here. And to bring this comparison to light uh, so that we uh, recognize and, and see uh, how that uh, this was ordained, this was planned. This was already in the scheme of the things eternal from God. But we want to look at it here in, again, the 10th chapter of Hebrews when we start speaking about uh, God presented Christ as a propitiation, uh, a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Let's see what Hebrews uh, 10th chapter, and I'm going to start it uh, at the third verse. And it says, but in those sacrifices, when we were talking about animal sacrifices, which occurred every year, which just became a ritual. It was, it's just like today, every year we have certain religious practices where we go through a 40-day fast. And right before the 40-day fast, we engage in a bunch of 
ungodly and worldly practices. And then it's as though I got to get this all out of my system because I'm getting ready to go on this 40 day fast. And then I can't do anything. You know, I got to cleanse myself out. And then next year, I'm going to do it again. And then next year, I'm going to do it again. And it just becomes a regular practice. Uh, but what it is to signify that's the thing that's lacking. That's the one thing that is not accomplished. So what we look at here uh, in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, uh, third verse, it says, But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. What I just finished saying about every year we're going to do this fast and, and we're going to party first and do all of the unclean, pleasurable things we enjoy doing. And then we're going to go through this little 40 day ritualistic fa uh, fasting period. And then after that, we're going to start tallying up. Uh oh, I'm already uh, tiltering on the other side of the pendulum. Well, next year I got that cleansing phase coming again. Uh, but we look at it, it says, for it is not possible, verse 4, that the bull of goats or, I mean, the blood, the blood of bulls or goats could make, could take away sins. Look and think about how many animals have been sacrificed, especially in this time in our society and culture where there is a lot of attention being directed towards the mistreatment of animals. But here it says, it's not possible that the blood of bulls or goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. What was the sacrifice that God actually uh uh, desired or actually that God preferred it is is that we would sacrifice the flesh of ourselves and I'm going to get to that in just a minute but we would sacrifice the flesh of ourselves and fulfill the spirit and will of God sacrifice me as we always say I must decrease so that he may increase it said, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So when we speak of uh, being justified freely, by the grace of God. This is the fulfillment of the eternal plan, the eternal will of God being made manifest in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Now, I also want to read from uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, this would be the 15th chapter. And I know that this is speaking of the uh, different uh, forms of resurrection. But uh, uh, since we have a lesson focusing on um, um, being all messed up and cleaned up and opened up and sin and righteousness and how this is viewed, uh, some of our focus to eliminate the past could probably be corrected if we begin to uh, look towards what we just finished uh, reading about the true sacrifice. So in 1 Corinthians in the uh, 15th chapter, uh, in the 45th verse, it reads this, And so it is written, The first Adam, or the first man, Adam, became a living soul. But the last Adam became a life giving spirit however the spiritual is not first but the natural and afterward the spirit the first man was of the earth natural made of dust the second man Christ is the Lord from heaven so when we come into being we first rec recognize our natural selves. 
So it says the first man was natural of the earth. But the second Adam was spiritual. We have to move from our natural to our spiritual. And the spiritual can always control and better prepare and perfect the natural. But the natural can never better prepare or perfect the spiritual. Now as we close into uh, All Cleaned Up, here we begin boasting about the law and uh, it says, where then is boasting? And this is verse 27 that we're reading. It says, it is excluded because of what? Law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. Now, as we look at this, our lesson speaks about the uh, faith before law. And then it talks about the circumcised and then the uncircumcised. And to that, we want to lift this point and then we will close. Now, now when we look at what is lifted here, so it's making a, a contradiction or a contrast to law and faith. Um, and it says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Then this here is verse 28. And then it says what we would assume to be uh, already obvious and already known. But it says, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Uh, we sang the song, red, yellow, black, and white, they are all precious in his sight. Being how that God is the creator of all things, all of creation, and not a respecter of person, then we know that all are precious unto God. But the question yet is raised in the 29th verse of Romans. Now, I want to just lift one other point uh, with reference to faith and law and then circumcised and uncircumcised. Now, in the fourth chapter of Romans, uh, it raises uh, this question here, and I'm going to begin at the ninth verse in the fourth chapter. And it says, does the blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised only? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Abraham's demonstration of being submissive to God, to God's will, was accounted as righteousness. And what Abraham did was his demonstrated his belief, his faith in what God asked him to do. But it says, how then was it accounted? Was this done while he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? Well, it was done while he was uncircumcised. So Abraham demonstrated an act of faith before the circumcision, before he began to practice one of the religious rites of the Hebrews, he already demonstrated a act of faith without the adherence of law. We have Abraham before we have Moses. So Abraham was already demonstrating faith in God without the adherence of law. Now, let's look at this also in verse 13, and, and it speaks here about justification apart from the law, not uh, adjoined to the law, but apart from the law. And it says, for the promise that he, 
he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Moses had not given the law. We're talking about Abraham preceding Moses. It says, for but through the righteousness of faith. Again, it was accounted. Abraham's demonstration, Abraham's submission was accounted to him for righteousness. And it says, verse 14, For if those who are of the law are heirs, uh, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. So as we look at, okay, uh, while there was conflict and great debate uh, between the Jews and the Greek, uh and with reference and also uh as Paul is speaking uh to the Gentiles with reference to being circumcised and not circumcised um uh we must also remember that the father of the nation the father of the seed of the nation who was promised to go out and look at the stars and just as you cannot count how many stars that there are. That's how many uh, nations are going to be brought about from your seed. But uh, during the time that this promise was made to Abraham, it wasn't because of his practice of the law. It was because of his submission to the will of God. So, 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 God is uh, not just looking at our uh, practice of rudiments of faith. Um, uh, some of us are, you know, uh, pumping ourselves up. Uh, and, and also, I would uh, also offer this. Uh, in your spare time, read the uh, seventh chapter of Matthew. Uh, it speaks to us in reference of judging, judging others. And it says, by the measure by which you judge others, you shall also be judged. And then it speaks to us a very familiar passage about while we're talking about the speck in our brother's eye, there's a plank in ours. And so remove the plank out of your eye uh, before you start talking about the speck that's in your brother's eye. So, um, we just wanted uh, to make the comparisons and the contrasting in our lesson uh, so that we understand what God is really looking for. Uh, not just our uh, uh, ritualistic practices or our routine of repetition of practice, but looking for the sincerity that uh, uh, above what we do according to our faith, that we not only do it as though we're tallying up a list of the things that we do as though we are seeking some kind of uh, reparation or some type of payment, but that we are doing what we do because we are guided by the Spirit of God and not by the uh, rudiments and the uh, yearly or annual events that we participate in, uh, so much so that we give more significance to the annual practice than what it represents. So God bless you and God keep you, as always, is our prayer.